Hello, my name is Massimo Mazzucco. I am a filmmaker and a blogger. I've been studying the events of September 11 since the day they happened. And currently I am a member of the 9-11 consensus panel. Based on scientific criteria, this international panel of experts on September 11 has compiled a list of the strongest evidence against the official version available to this day. As a filmmaker, I've also made three documentaries on this highly controversial issue. The first one, Inganno Globale, was broadcast in 2006 by Italian television and ended up triggering a national debate on September 11 in my country that lasted a good couple of years. The second film was completed in 2009 and is called The New American Century. This film takes a look at the historical, economical and political background that was possibly behind the very origin of the 9-11 attacks the so-called inside job hypothesis, just to be clear. Once you understand the geopolitical issues regarding the energetic resources in that part of the world, you will also understand the urgent need for the United States to invade Afghanistan and then Iraq, and therefore the need for a credible excuse to do so under the pretense of having been attacked on September 11. In 2013, I completed my third and last documentary on September 11, called September 11, The New Pearl Harbor. This is a very long documentary. It's actually five hours long. The reason for being so long is that it presents the entire history of the 9-11 debate worldwide seen from both sides of the aisle. In other words, for each issue ever debated, you can hear both the arguments against the official version by the 9-11 Truth Movement and the arguments in support of the official version by the so-called debunkers. Because the film is so long, I've decided to make this video presentation which summarizes the main points presented in the film. Now obviously, this being a summary, I cannot prove all the statements that I'll be making here, so I encourage you to verify each and every one of them by watching the entire film. Like all my other films, this one is also available online for free on YouTube. Or if you prefer, you can purchase the DVD either at Amazon or from my website, and then you are free to make as many copies as you want to give them away to your friends. Now for the summary of the film. The film is divided in seven parts plus the introduction. The introduction presents 12 historic parallels between Pearl Harbor and September 11. Among these parallels are the fact that both administrations knew in advance that there was going to be an attack, that in both cases top levels of the administration ordered the defense not to intervene so that the attacks could actually succeed, and that in both cases the official commissions tried to cover up the truth rather than reveal it to the public. The film then introduces the most important debunkers worldwide in Italy, France and the US. As we have said before, with the term debunker, we call the people who support the official version of the events given to the world by the American government. In this case, that the attacks were carried out by 19 Islamic hijackers and that the Twin Towers fell because of the impacts of the planes and the ensuing fires. This is substantially the official version of September 11. Part one of the film begins to question the official narrative of the events by taking a closer look at one of the main still unresolved issues of 9-11. How was it possible for four hijacked airplanes to fly around the U.S. for a total of one and a half hours without being intercepted? The U.S. air defense is arguably the most organized and effective in the world, and it's hardly believable that those hijackers could roam undisturbed for such a long time, in some cases even traveling hundreds of miles in one direction, before turning around and eventually hitting their target. The debunkers will tell you that the reason why the planes were not intercepted is because the hijackers turn off their transponders, the device that identifies the plane to the air traffic controllers, thus making the airplanes very difficult to locate. This is the first big lie of September 11. By analyzing the interviews and the radio communications of the air traffic controllers, it turns out that except for brief moments of confusion, all four airplanes were being tracked at all times. 8,200 feet. 8,200 feet, and he's on the same code that he was before. They knew where they were, but they couldn't get to them. And the real reason for not being able to get to them is that on September 11, so many military exercises had been scheduled at the same time that only four jets remained on alert to defend the entire northeastern sector of the United States.
I've determined, of course, that with only four aircraft, we cannot defend the whole northeastern United States. That was the sensation of frustration, of I don't have the forces available to do anything about this. The frantic search for fighters to be used against the hijacked airplanes can be clearly heard on the radio communications recorded by the military and the air traffic controllers. And you guys are the closest, and we need somebody airborne. Got no loose, we got no fighters. Syracuse 2 airborne in 20 minutes. We got no weapons. They, they just went on a straight run up to the range. They blew out their load. So the question becomes whether sending away so many fighters on the same day was intentional or was it just a coincidence? The debunkers will tell you that it was just bad luck, that it was unfortunate, that on that particular day there were practically no planes ready to defend the country. This is the second big lie of September 11. As it turns out, there had been so many warnings by foreign secret services that an attack using hijacked airplane was imminent that nobody in their right state of mind would have ever thought of leaving the country without air defenses at any given time. In fact, the number of warnings had been so high and insistent that it would have been wise to double or triple the fighter jets available all across the country, and certainly not to reduce them to near zero. So once you look at all these warnings collectively, it becomes very clear that the scheduling of so many drills on the same day had to be intentional. And it's difficult to imagine any other purpose than to allow the hijackings to succeed. This brings up the first question posed by the film to the debunkers. Knowing that the attacks were imminent, knowing that they might involve hijacked airliners, but not knowing where and when they could happen, would have been a good reason to beef up the defense and keep even more jets than usual on alert all across the country. Why instead schedule so many exercises in one day while leaving only four jets on alert to defend the very sector of the country that was most likely to be attacked? Furthermore, as a proof that the military did everything possible not to intercept the airplanes, we also have one simple fact. When the top generals in charge, Myers and Eberhardt, knew by their own admission that the country was being attacked by hijacked airplanes at 9.03, that is, when the second tower was hit, Neither general thought of recalling the fighters that were out doing the exercises. In fact, General Eberhardt chose to disappear from radar and went literally incommunicado for over 30 minutes during the most crucial hours of the attacks. Only at 11 past 10, more than one hour after everyone in the world knew that the country was under attack by hijacked airplanes, were the military drills finally suspended. This is our gap paracon, and I'm Fred Mitchell. Yes. Uh, what we need you to do right now is to terminate all exercise input coming into Cheyenne Mountain. By then, also the fourth hijacked airplane had been turned into a pile of smoking rubble. That brings up the following questions. After having realized that the country was being attacked by hijacked airplanes at 9.03, why didn't Eberhard immediately suspend all the war games and recall all the available jets to their bases? Why didn't Myers order him to do so after having been briefed by Eberhard on the ongoing attack? And why hasn't the 9-11 Commission ever asked either general these most fundamental questions? Also, Donald Rumsfeld, the very Secretary of Defense, went missing without a clear explanation for at least half an hour during the crucial hours of the attack. In fact, the entire chain of command had been butchered to such an extent by untrained substitutes and unjustified absentees that it made it literally impossible for the air defense to intervene effectively against the hijacked airplanes, even if they had tried to. At the end of the day, however, the most surprising fact may be that, despite this catastrophic failure to defend the country, most of the people involved at the highest levels kept their posts or were even promoted to higher levels after 9-11. As if having contributed to this historic defensive failure were somehow considered an achievement and not a reason for discharge or reprimand. Richard B. Myers, despite the total breakdown under his leadership, was promoted to chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the highest military post in the country. On September 13, confirmation hearings were held for General Myers, as if nothing ever happened, while people were still being pulled alive from the rubble at Ground Zero. And there is one more element that supports the allegation of a government's involvement in the attacks. The behavior of Vice President Cheney in the White House. Since President Bush was away in Florida, 
Dick Cheney had effectively taken control of the operations from the so-called PIOC, the bunker located under the White House. During the hours of the attack, Vice President Cheney was kept informed that one unidentified plane was headed at full speed towards Washington. Uh, there was a young man who would come in and say to the Vice President, the, the plane is 50 miles out, the plane is 30 miles out. Now, given that two towers in New York had already been hit by hijacked airplanes, Cheney should have ordered the unknown plane shot down as it approached Washington protected airspace. We do know from the recordings that the White House had the actual means to shoot down any incoming danger approaching the Capitol. Hello there, Washington approach. Right. Make sure that the center does not have anything above our airspace also. The Secret Service is going to start shooting at anything in the air. Well, not only didn't Cheney order the shoot down, but he issued a different order instead that in fact allowed the plane to enter Washington's protected airspace and eventually reach the Pentagon. Thus, the following two questions. The Secret Service knew about the incoming plane for the last 30 minutes, was following it on radar, had the means to shoot it down, and should have done so in order to protect the Capitol, but they didn't. Why? In regards to the exchange between Cheney and the young man, can you suggest anything different from an order not to shoot down the plane as it was approaching Washington's protected airspace? One last element that confirms the pre-knowledge of the events by the military is one episode that actually took place within the Pentagon. As many people know, the plane that hit the Pentagon did not simply plunge on the roofs of the building from the top, as any suicide pilot would be expected to do. But he went around in a large circle and ended up approaching and hitting the Pentagon on the side, flying very close to the ground. Despite this extremely difficult and totally illogical maneuver, there seems to have been someone in the highest ranks of the military who knew exactly that the external ring of the Pentagon, and not the roofs, was going to be the next target. And, uh, and I bumped into a U.S. military intelligence official, and, and he leaned in and he said, this attack was so well coordinated that if I were you, I would stay off the E-ring where our NBC office was, the outer ring of the Pentagon, the rest of the day, because we're next. Question. Even if someone could predict that the Pentagon would become a target, one would imagine a plane to plunge from the skies onto the roofs of the building. Why would anyone suggest to stay away from the external ring, in particular, unless he knew in advance what was going to happen? All in all, if one examines all the facts available, the military drills all in the same day, the unexplained absentees, the butchered chain of command, the behavior of the top generals who refused to recall the jets from the drills, the failure by the White House to shoot down the incoming unknown airplane, and the pre-knowledge of the event at the Pentagon, it becomes very difficult to maintain that the military and the top ranks of government were not involved in some way or form in the September 11 attacks. Now, of course, if you want to do that, you also need your patsies. And here is where the so-called 19 Islamic hijackers come into the picture. There are so many problems with these hijackers that one hardly knows where to begin. Possibly, the biggest problem of all is that these guys were not able to fly at all. None of them had ever piloted a large airliner before, and two of them were in fact not even allowed to fly alone in small training airplanes because their instructors had decided that they were unfit to fly solo. The debunkers will tell you that these guys didn't really need to know how to fly an airplane and that all they needed to do was to take control of the cockpit and set the autopilot to their destination. This is another big lie that you will hear over and over in the 9-11 debate. The truth is, if you examine the radar tracks and listen to the reports by the air traffic controllers, these guys performed some incredibly difficult maneuvers in the sky that even the most talented pilots with 30 years of experience would not be able to perform. Furthermore, Radar tracks show ascent rates of 3,000 feet per minute and descent rates of 10,000 feet per minute, which is hardly how the autopilot would take you from one place to another. So not only those four amateurs could not have piloted the planes in the way it was observed, but we also lack any proof whatsoever that they were even on board of those planes to begin with. Number one, even though we are told that they boarded the planes under their own names, for some reason, no Arabic name appeared in the passengers list 
that were released to the media after the attacks. Not one. You can read the lists online. There is no Arabic names there. Number two, there is not a single picture of any of the 19 hijackers at any of the three departing airports on the morning of September 11. Now, if you and I had hijacked one of those airplanes on September 11, you can be sure that there would be pictures of us all over the airport, at the check-in, in the lounge areas, at the security checks, at the departing gates. Well, not one picture of any of these 19 guys has ever been shown to us at any of those airports on September 11. Number three, we don't have a single soundbite from the black boxes confirming the presence of these guys in the cockpit. One would assume that after they broke into the cockpits, you would have the recordings of the struggles with the pilots on the black boxes, but we have never heard any of that either. So no names on the passengers' lists, no pictures of these guys at the airports, and no sound bites from the cockpit voice recorders. Given that these guys were not able to fly those planes at all, please give me one good reason why we should believe that they were even aboard those planes to begin with. This fact obviously opens up a whole new Pandora's box, because we also know that no professional pilot, not even at gunpoint, would ever crash one of those planes into a populated building like the Twin Towers. If anything, worse came to worst, at the last minute he would have crashed the plane into the sea or into a less populated area, but certainly not in Manhattan. I don't believe any airline pilot would intentionally fly into the World Trade Center even with a gun at his head. So this leaves us with really just one viable option, that the planes that hit the targets were not the same planes that left the airports that morning, but were remote-controlled military drones, which means that the passengers of the original flights met their fate in a totally different location. This is a very complex and delicate issue that it's hard to summarize here. And for this reason, I invite you to watch the entire chapter of the film called What Happened to the Passengers. In fact, there are many elements that support the idea that these were military drones and not regular planes. The most important is that all four planes were clocked at speeds that highly exceeded the structural limits of regular passenger planes. In other words, if those had been real passenger planes, at those speeds they would have had to disintegrate in flight. As different pilots and aeronautical experts will tell you in the interviews, you would need especially prepared planes with special engines to achieve those extremely high speeds at low altitudes. Another element that suggests that the passengers met their fate at a place different from the crash sites is the fact that the calls they placed to their relatives from their cell phones could not have been placed from the planes in flight. Those calls were obviously made as the relatives received them, but they could not have been made from the planes in flight. This is clearly shown by cross-referencing the FBI reports on the calls made with the altitude and the speed at which the planes were flying when those phone calls were made. At the end of the day, we have at least nine phone calls that did happen but could not have been made from the airplanes in flight, as we were told. In particular, there is one chilling message left in her husband's answering machine by one of the flight attendants of Flight 93, which strongly suggests that the entire hijacking operation went in fact very differently from the way we were told. After saying goodbye, she seems to fumble with the headset while she whispers a few more words into the mouthpiece. I hope to be able to see your face again, baby. I love you. Bye. End of message. Even by playing the segment several times, it remains difficult to hear anything different from the words, it's a frame. So far, we have analyzed the general problems with the hijackings and the air defense. Let's look now more closely at each of the three locations of the attacks. The Pentagon, the plane that allegedly crashed in Pennsylvania, and the destruction of the World Trade Center. The official version by the government claims that the Pentagon was hit by the hijacked flight American 77, but there is no proof whatsoever that this was the case. In fact, there is ample evidence that the Pentagon was not hit by a Boeing 757 at all. Among this evidence is the fact that no large piece of the airplane can be found anywhere, outside or inside the building. The core of the engines, which is supposed to be indestructible, is also missing. 
the opening at the base of the building is only about half the size of the projected wingspan of a 757, while the windows at the side of the opening clearly show that they were not hit by the wing of an airplane. Also, the windows that are supposed to have been hit by the tail are still intact, with wooden frame, glass and all. And by using the drawings by the American Society of Civil Engineers, which published an extremely accurate column-by-column -column assessment of the situation inside the building, it becomes very clear that the damage inside the Pentagon could not have been created by a 757. This is the summary from the film of the damage analysis at the Pentagon. In conclusion, we have an opening on the first floor that's a bit more than half the projected wingspan of a 757, the tip of the left wing and most of the right wing missing without a valid explanation, the horizontal stabilizers and the tail also missing without a valid explanation, a fuselage that behaved more like a warhead than an empty cylinder made with aluminum, no trace whatsoever of the core of the two engines and an exit hole on the C-ring that no one can rationally explain. Given all these facts, we must conclude that the damage observed at the Pentagon is not compatible with and must have been created by something other than a Boeing 757. Furthermore, there is the mystery of the missing tapes from the impact. By the FBI's own account, there were at least 85 different cameras showing either the area of approach or the area of impact at the Pentagon. But for some unexplained reason, all these tapes were confiscated by the FBI and no one has ever been able to see them. Filmmaker Michael Moore has described this problem quite clearly. I've uh, filmed before down at the Pentagon, before 9-11. There's got to be at least a hundred video cameras ringing that building, in the trees, everywhere. They've got that plane coming in, in a, at a, with a hundred angles. I want to see the video. I want to see a hundred videos that exist of this. Why don't they want us to see that plane coming into the building? Only one video was released. It was actually a double video, two cameras placed next to each other, which unfortunately shows the moment of the explosion, but not the airplane in transit. And by analyzing this double video frame by frame, we can show that the actual footage was intentionally doctored or photoshopped in order to erase the only available image of the plane in transit. All in all, the situation at the Pentagon can be summarized as follows. If we now summarize the situation at the Pentagon, we have the total lack of evidence that the unknown incoming was in fact Flight 77, a mysterious phantom plane that attracted the attention in the opposite direction, the failure from the White House to shoot down the incoming even though it posed a serious and imminent threat, a totally illogical approach maneuver from a terrorist's point of view, an alleged hijacker incapable of performing that maneuver, the absence of any significant part of the plane from the wreckage, a damage to the building clearly incompatible with a 757, a doctored tape of the impact, and the obvious reluctance by the FBI to release any other tape that could allow the identification of the plane. For United 93, the plane that allegedly crashed in Pennsylvania, we have a similar situation to the Pentagon. The official version claims that the plane was intentionally brought down by the passengers after they had revolted against the hijackers, but no evidence of the crash can be found whatsoever. Here too, like at the Pentagon, there are no major pieces of wreckage visible, no parts of the fuselage, no landing gears, no wings, no suitcases, no tail, no passenger seats, and not even the bodies of the passengers themselves. Every single witness who reached the spot right after the explosion, including the mayor of Shanksville, says that there were no signs of a plane having crashed there whatsoever. All there was was this hole in the ground, only a few feet deep and a few yards wide. And there's no airplane. Nowhere, kein Flugzeug. Sie wurden hier zu der Unfallstelle geschickt und da war kein Flugzeug. Nein, da war nichts. Nur dieses Loch. This is it. Das ist es, was sie sahen. To explain this apparent mystery, the FBI told us that the plane is actually there, but we cannot see it because it was almost entirely buried underground. How did it get underground and how did that hole close by itself even before the first responders arrived? Nobody has explained. On the other hand, we have ample evidence that the plane actually exploded in midair as pieces of the wreckage were found as far as eight miles away from the crash site on a day when there was practically no wind. 
Clearly, the official story of the plane having been crashed intentionally in Shanksville and hitting the ground in one piece does not have a leg to stand on. This is the summary from the film on Flight 93. If we now summarize Flight 93, we have no proof whatsoever that the terrorists boarded the plane, nor that they were ever in the cockpit. An alleged hijacker who could not have flown an airliner in the way that Flight 93 was flown. A false concurrent hijacking that called the attention away from the real one. No proof whatsoever that Flight 93 crashed in the field near Shanksville. An extended debris field which flatly disproves the official version of the crash and suggests that the plane broke up in mid-air instead an unexplained small white jet leaving the area right after the impact. And the fact that the passengers who called from their cell phones could not have been on that plane to begin with, which strongly suggests their revolt was a scripted, fictional event intended to fuel a prefabricated legend. Then, of course, we have the most important argument of the entire debate, which is the destruction of the World Trade Center. This is the tragedy that we all witnessed on TV, with the collapse of both towers, being broadcast live all around the world. It's very hot. I don't see any air anymore. Okay. All I see is smoke. Smoke rises. We're on the floor. We're in the window. Can you Can you stay on the line with me, please? Yes, ma'am. I'm going to die, aren't I? No, 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 no. Say I'm going to die. Ma'am, ma'am, say your prayers. What the hell happened? Oh, my God. Oh, God! The destruction of the Twin Towers, and whether they fell on their own because of the damage by the impact, or they were brought down intentionally, has been the centerpiece of the entire debate on September 11 for many years. And here I must say one thing. When I first heard of the possibility that the Twin Towers had been demolished intentionally, I myself reacted by rejecting this idea. It's not possible, I said. Americans would never do that to themselves. But then I started looking at the evidence, and the more I looked, the more it became clear to me that this, in fact, could only have been a controlled demolition. The first thing that one should know is that the Twin Towers were not at all those wonderful jewels that we were told. They were obsolete, extremely expensive buildings, and they needed to go. The Twin Towers, in fact, were so much filled with asbestos from top to bottom that they had become a huge liability for the Port Authority, the owners at the time. The towers could no longer be repaired without incurring the skyrocketing cost of removal and disposal of the asbestos, but they could not be demolished because of the large amounts of asbestos they contained. A solution apparently was found by transferring the ownership to a private investor, one Larry Silverstein, who immediately took out a $3.2 billion insurance against the destruction of the towers by a terrorist attack. Only six weeks later, the towers were destroyed by a terrorist attack. Silverstein got all his money to rebuild as he wanted, and the first responders and the people in Lower Manhattan ended up breathing all the asbestos that the towers contained. The debate on the collapse of the Twin Towers has been long, complicated, and somehow confused at least up to 2006. But in 2006, things started to become more clear when an organization called Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth was founded by San Francisco architect Richard Gage. This organization, which counts to this day more than 2,500 signatories from all over the world, has proven with rock-solid scientific arguments that the Twin Towers did not fall for a gravitational collapse and that they could have only been destroyed by a controlled demolition. In fact, after architects and engineers entered the fray, the debate was substantially over. Because now, if anybody wants to keep supporting the official version of the collapses, they would have to first refute the scientific arguments by architects and engineers, and no one to this date has been able to do so. One of the main problems with the official version, which has been highlighted by architects and engineers, is the fact that the heat developed by the fires from the airplane impacts would not have been sufficient to even trigger the initial collapse let alone to bring about the complete destruction of the two buildings from top to bottom. Along the years, the debunkers have come up with different theories in order to explain the full destruction of the two buildings by a gravitational collapse. But none of them stands to scrutiny, 
And in fact, the very NIST, the organization tasked by the government to explain the collapses, has simply refused to do so. To this date, we have no official explanation for the complete collapse of the two towers. Once the collapse initiated, the video evidence is rather clear. It, it was not stopped by the floors below, so there was no calculation that we did uh, to demonstrate that, uh, what is clear from the good videos. This is tantamount to saying, once the Pearl Harbor attack initiated, the video evidence shows that the U.S. fleet was quickly overwhelmed by the Japanese, so we didn't feel the need to find out why it happened. Furthermore, there is ample evidence that the buildings were in fact demolished intentionally by the use of explosives. First of all, there are plenty of testimonies from reporters and bystanders of explosions heard just before and during the collapses. In fact, the New York Times has published a list of over 100 testimonies by firefighters, policemen and first responders who claim to have heard explosions during the collapses. The debunkers, however, will tell you that there is no proof that there were explosions because, they say, no explosion was ever recorded on tape. This is patently false. This one was recorded after both of the Twin Towers had collapsed and before Tower 7's collapse. There are even explosions that can be heard in the original footage by the networks at the beginning of the collapse of the two towers. Here, the police officers, FBI. Here, the police officers, FBI. Here, the police officers, FBI. Another important argument in favor of a controlled demolition is the presence of the so-called squibs, the clouds of dust that appear on the sides of the towers during the collapses. These are the classic result of explosions as normally seen in controlled demolitions. The debunkers maintain that these were just windows exploding because of the air pressure. But by analyzing the actual structure of the building, one can easily prove that this theory is untenable. These are explosions, and some powerful ones indeed. Furthermore, extreme temperatures were observed under the rubble for months after the collapses, and molten steel was found in several instances. This formation is really four separate stories of the World Trade Center, compressed, compacted, incinerated, exposed to temperatures as hot as the inner Earth. You never knew this existed. Obviously, both the extreme temperatures and the molten steel, and in some cases even molten concrete, could not have been caused by the jet fuel alone. And they are the proof that some kind of destructive device capable of generating immense heat was used in the demolition of the towers. We also have the unexplained total pulverization of many of the bodies, as much as 41% of them, for which it was impossible to even find fragments large enough to extract DNA. Gone, never found, as if they had never existed. 1,100 victims completely unaccounted for. In other words, no pieces large enough to gain any DNA from, vaporized. Can fire and a gravitational collapse account for this massive pulverization of people? Obviously not. The use of extremely powerful explosives seems to be the only valid explanation for the total disappearance of so many of the victims' bodies. But the main scientific argument for a controlled demolition is the one of freefall. Imagine you drop the piano from a window on the top floor of the tower at the same time that the tower begins to collapse. Which one do you think would hit the ground first? The piano or the top of the tower? One would say the piano, of course, because the piano has a free path towards the ground, while the tower needs to destroy the entire healthy structure below before it reaches the ground. Well, as it turns out instead, both the piano and the top of the tower would reach the ground practically at the same time. This means that they both fell with free fall acceleration. And as architects and engineers have repeatedly shown in their presentations, this could only happen if something else is removing the healthy structure below the falling tower. The fact that it's coming down at free fall says all of the energy is being used to just make it go straight down, which means it's coming down through itself and not breaking up the building as it goes, something else has to be clearing the way. And there is only one method known to remove the structure while the top of the building collapses, and that is the use of explosives in a controlled demolition. 
This is how the film summarizes the main arguments regarding the destruction of the Twin Towers. At this point, we can summarize the evidence for a gravitational collapse and compare it with the one for controlled demolitions. The official explanation for the initial collapse, or sagging trusses theory, is fundamentally flawed for at least three reasons. There is no evidence that the fireproofing was widely dislodged from the steel trusses, no evidence for temperatures high enough to seriously weaken the steel, and no valid explanation on how the trusses could have pulled and broken the external structure on their own. At the same time, the initial collapse is fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The official explanation for the total collapse of the Twin Towers does not exist, nor was a scientific calculation ever attempted by NIST, as they have repeatedly acknowledged. At the same time, the full collapse of the buildings is fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The vertical acceleration of the upper sections to near free fall speed makes it impossible to explain the collapses by gravitation only, without violating at least two fundamental laws of physics. At the same time, the near free fall acceleration achieved by the collapsing towers is fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The amount of witnesses who reported powerful explosions and the ensuing devastation in the Twin Towers is overwhelming. Such explosions cannot be explained by jet fuel alone, while they are fully compatible with a controlled demolition. The squibs observed 30 and 40 floors below the level of collapse cannot be explained by the air pressure in a gravitational collapse. At the same time, squibs are the typical signature of controlled demolitions. Not all the diagonal cuts and V-cuts observed on the columns at ground zero can be explained by the removal operations. At the same time, these kind of cuts are another typical signature of controlled demolitions. The large area of debris around the towers, with the lateral ejection of elements weighing several tons, cannot be explained by a gravitational collapse. At the same time, these ejections are fully compatible with the use of powerful explosives. The long-lasting fires, the extreme temperatures under the rubble, the incandescent beams extracted during the cleanup, the high degree of deformation of massive steel beams, the molten steel and molten concrete observed and found at ground zero cannot be explained by jet fuel alone, nor by regular office fires. Highly effective destructive devices capable of developing extremely high temperatures must have been used as part of a controlled demolition. The almost complete pulverization of the contents of both towers, from the concrete floors to the office furnishings to the actual vaporization of victims' bodies, cannot be explained by a simple gravitational collapse. At the same time, these results are fully compatible with the presence of powerful explosives, such as those used in controlled demolitions. Unless a comprehensive, scientifically sound explanation for all the phenomena observed is presented, the only conclusion available is that the Twin Towers were brought down by some form of controlled demolition. As many probably don't even know, there was a third skyscraper from the World Trade Center that collapsed on September 11. It was the so-called Building 7. Now, without a reason, Building 7 has been called the smoking gun of September 11 as the building collapsed entirely on its footprint in a little more than six seconds without ever even being hit by an airplane. NIST, the governmental organization, has tried their best to come up with some explanation for this collapse due to fire, but architects and engineers have flatly refuted their explanations as totally untenable. In fact, the evidence for the controlled demolition of Building 7 is so overwhelming that even the debunkers have given up on trying to explain it as a gravitational collapse. Among the evidence for controlled demolition is the symmetry of the collapse, which requires the almost simultaneous removal of all the supporting columns in order to be achieved. And obviously there's only one known way to remove all the supporting columns at the same time, and that is through the use of explosives in a controlled demolition. Another piece of evidence is that the police and the fire department knew in advance that the building was about to be demolished when they cleared the area using the very words, the building is about to blow up. Some witnesses even heard the actual countdown before the explosives were detonated. All the time he had his hand over the radio while he was getting a countdown. And then he's just like, at the last three seconds, he takes his hand off and you hear three, two, one. And but the largest, irrefutable piece of evidence in the case of Building 7 is again the free fall of the building for the first eight stories of the collapse. 
This freefall has been clearly demonstrated by architects and engineers in their videos and was even admitted in writing by NIST in their own final report. The building didn't disappear so the building can fall for 100 feet at free fall speed. That's impossible. That evidence alone would indicate that the official story doesn't hold water. So there we have it. At the end of the day, none of the major aspects of the official story of September 11 holds water. The hijackings could not have happened without the complicity of somebody in the highest levels of the defense. The hijackers could not have flown the planes in the way they were flown, and they were probably not even on board of those planes to begin with. The planes themselves were most likely military drones and not regular passenger planes. The phone calls from the cellular phones could not have been placed from the airplanes in flight. There is no evidence whatsoever that a Boeing 757 hit the Pentagon, while there is plenty of evidence that it actually didn't. There is no evidence whatsoever that another 757 crashed in the fields of Shanksville in Pennsylvania, while there is plenty of evidence that it was shot down in midair. The Twin Towers could only have collapsed in the way they did as a result of a controlled demolition, and so did Building 7 in the afternoon of September 11. Now each of us is faced with the question of what to do with this evidence. Disregard it and just pretend it doesn't exist, or begin to seriously reconsider the entire issue of September 11 and the consequences it has brought on all of us in the last 15 years of our lives. This is not for me to preach, but for each of you to decide. All I can do is leave you with the last two questions posed by the film, and thank you for the time that you have spent watching this video, and hopefully the time that you will spend analyzing the full evidence from the actual documentary. This brings us to the last question, which is not only for the debunkers, but for anyone who cares about freedom, democracy, and an honest government. If you were aware of solid evidence disproving the official version and suggesting the involvement of some rogue elements of the government in the terrorist attacks, would it be more unpatriotic and anti-American to ask for a new investigation or to turn a blind eye to it and pretend such evidence doesn't exist? Given that the people's trust in institutions is of paramount importance for a nation's well-being, would that trust be better served by denying the evidence of a conspiracy or by bringing those suspected to accountability in a court of law?